Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerSportsBetting.com, on Roku, look us up, Dwyer Boxing News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. I'm picking the underdog. I'm picking the upset. In the Nathan Cleverly, Sergei Kovalev upcoming fight. I think Kovalev wins this fight. In fact, I'm expecting Kovalev to get a knockout. The way I'd play it, since the casino is giving you enough leverage here, is I would simply take Kovalev to win the fight. And I would hedge the play with Cleverly by decision. Right, let's talk about it. Let's get philosophical for a second. You know, the great Bill Russell, NBA Hall of Famer, always says that the great ones are different, right? They're outside the box. They do things in an unorthodox manner. You really can't follow what they do literally because it's almost impossible to replicate. Now, Nathan Cleverly used to train with a great fighter who was out the box and unorthodox, Joe Calzaghe. Calzaghe, simply put, had some of the fastest hands I have ever seen, right? Certainly at 168 pounds, Calzaghe's hands were lightning fast. Also, Calzaghe was a southpaw. So when you couple the hand speed with the southpaw angles, as well as the volume, right? Calzaghe didn't just throw fast punches. He threw fast punches for entire fights. What you got was a fighter who, quite frankly, overwhelmed opponents. Also, Calzaghe was 5'11", 5'11 and a half. He wasn't that tall, so there was less to hit, right? So he would come in and simply overwhelm you. If you couldn't handle the hand speed, you were finished, right? Calzaghe didn't have to focus on too many other things. He didn't have to focus on a lot of defense, right? He didn't have to load up on his punches, because his hand speed was such that whether it was Peter Manfredo on the side of the ring or Roy Jones on the side of the ring, opponents were overwhelmed, right? This is the proverbial fastball pitcher who can literally throw it 100 miles an hour and doesn't really have to spot the pitch that much. You know it's coming. The speed is such that you can't do anything about it. That kind of talent is rare. I don't believe, we're on YouTube, let's be hard, I don't believe that Nathan Cleverly has Joe Calzaghe's talent level, right? For one, Cleverly is orthodox. He's not a southpaw. So Cleverly's easier to replicate, quite frankly in preparing for a fight than Joe Calzaghe, right? Good luck finding a southpaw with Calzaghe's hand speed and volume, right? Calzaghe had Paul Williams type volume with faster hands than Paul Williams. Just like the Punisher was hard to replicate in preparing for a fight, so too was Calzaghe. Nathan Cleverly, an orthodox fighter, isn't as hard to replicate. Nathan Cleverly has fast hands. He doesn't have hands as fast as Joe Calzaghe, right? There's a difference between a 100 mile an hour fastball and let's say a 94 mile an hour fastball, right? Also, you can find Nathan Cleverly more than you can Joe Calzaghe because Nathan Cleverly six one and a half, right? He's taller than Joe Calzaghe, right? Cal Calzaghe, harder to find, knew how to crouch a little bit, 
I don't believe Nathan Cleverly does. So I believe Nathan Cleverly and longtime viewers know that I've been a skeptic of Cleverly for some time. I think Nathan Cleverly, quite frankly, has made a mistake trying to model his game after Joe Calzaghe's game. Right? Calzaghe's out the box. To me, that would be as mistaken as trying to model your game on Roy Jones's game without having Roy Jones's speed. Right? You need to marry what you have to the style you're going after. Right? Now, Nathan Cleverly, in my opinion, has ignored defense. He's not that good defensively. Nathan Cleverly's volume, quite frankly, is too high. In my opinion, there is such a thing as too much volume. When you're throwing punches, you open yourself up for counters, right? I believe Nathan Cleverly throws too many punches. Look at the CompuBox number for his fight against Robin Krasnicki. You're going to see multiple rounds, multiple rounds, where Cleverly throws more than a hundred punches around, right? Now, again, I'm not saying that never works. He did a great job on Robin Krasnicki, right? Joe Calzaghe spent his career outworking opponents, right? That can work, but I don't believe it does work against a puncher like Kovalev, right? Kovalev isn't just a great puncher. Kovalev is accurate. He's not a free swinger. Look at his CompuBox numbers. He's landing something like 40% of his punches, right? He's not swinging and missing. He's not, dare I say it, Lucas Matisse. This guy actually is very accurate. And keep in mind, look at the guys he's fighting. He beat Gabriel Campillo, former champion. Difficult matchup. A guy who makes you miss. I'll tell you what, Kovalev didn't miss that much in that fight. In other words, Kovalev has faced slick opponents with boxing skills who are flashing angles at him. And the guy is still accurate. The guy has shown an ability to get past an opponent's jab. Right? He has decent foot speed. So what we have here is a guy who has neglected his defense, in my opinion, has neglected the finer parts of the sport, in Nathan Cleverly, right? And he literally leaves himself open in a way that Joe Calzaghe was able to get away with, right? You remember Calzaghe sometimes came in too square two-handed attack most of the time. Cleverly has the same habits. The difference is, if you're Calzaghe going at 100 miles an hour, you're, you're going to get away with things that I don't believe Nathan Cleverly is going to get away with against Kovalev. Let me also say this, too. You know, they're good punchers, then they're great punchers. Right? Now, I'm not sure exactly... What makes a guy a great puncher? Because on film, it's unclear, right? You look at a guy like Big George Foreman later in his career. He's throwing punches at about five miles an hour, right? Not a lot of hand speed. But when they got there, opponents went down, right? You look at Valero. I know he's a controversial figure. He's also one of the best punchers in recent memory. He's no longer with us, right? That guy literally, you know, could be off balance, it looked like. Looked like he was throwing regular punches. Opponents were hurt. Opponents went down. You look at Janady Golovkin, another big puncher. 
doesn't even look at times like he's trying that hard. But yet, opponents are getting hurt, right? I believe the great punchers all have one thing in common. Built-in leverage, right? For whatever reason, they have the timing down where they have the proper lean into a punch as they throw it. And they can do it repeatedly. I don't believe it comes across on film other than in the impact. Kovalev is not a good puncher. He is a great puncher. He's one of the very best punchers in the sport. Right? It's more than letting his hands go. He has his body weight in the punches. They're not arm punches, and he makes it look easy, right? This guy is an elite puncher. Keith Thurman calls himself one time or one touch or something like that, right? The inference is he hits you once, and you're done for the night. Kovalev is the same way. He only has to touch you once to change the course of the fight. I simply don't believe that Nathan Cleverly is going to be able to come in and smother Kovalev, right? I believe Kovalev is just wired to deal with chaos. He's already dealt with active jabs and moving opponents. Let me also say something, too, about Cleverly. You know, it's sad to me that cleverly hasn't figured out a way to leverage his height. In other words, a tall, athletic guy like this, and cleverly is very athletic, right? Cleverly is a great athlete. Should be able to operate more behind a jab. No matter how good you are at a Joe Calzaghe game, right? High volume in the guy's face, you're smothering the guy, no matter how good you are doing that, you should always have a plan B mode for exactly fights like this. When you're fighting a guy who, quite frankly, hits harder, and I mean much harder, than Tony Bellew, right? And let's face it, that Cleverly Bellew fight was a war, right? Now you're going up against a guy who hits even harder than that. I believe the great fighters... have alternative strategies, have alternative modes that they can click into when needed. Nathan Cleverly, quite frankly, with his hand speed, his height, and his, athletic, his athleticism should be more mobile in the ring. He shouldn't be bending over trading punches like he does. He shouldn't have roots to the canvas. Right? He should be lighter on his feet. He should be sticking and moving. He should let Kovalev know that the fight doesn't start until Kovalev finds a way to shorten the distance between the two fighters. But that's not who Cleverly is. Cleverly is more of a fighter than a boxer. And he's a fighter, quite frankly, without a 44 Magnum gun. He doesn't hit that hard. Right? He overwhelms you with volume, not punching power. So what I believe is going to happen in this fight is by the third round, it's going to be a shootout. The man with the volume and the faster hands is going to be Nathan Cleverly. The man with the bigger bullets is going to be Kovalev. I think Kovalev shoots down Nathan Cleverly. I don't see this fight going the distance. I like the underdog, and I like the underdog by knockout. The way I'm playing it is simply to take the underdog hedged with the champion by decision. Right? But for higher risk gamblers than I, you might want to consider some of the knockout props. If Cleverly is as immobile as I think he's going to be, something's going to happen in the first six rounds of this fight. Okay, just just food for thought. 
I think the belt changes hands. I like Kovalev to win the fight. I'm expecting a knockout, but I'm betting it conservatively. Just taking the underdog to win the fight, hedged with the favorite by decision. Let me know how you're playing it. Thanks for stopping by.